I'm going to be talking about the quantum dump harmonics later. And um, for this, uh, let me first just put it on complete. Okay. So uh, do you see well the screen? You, you can see yeah, it no, well? No, no, it's fine. Now it's full screen. Thanks. Excellent. So yes, uh, I'm going to be talking about how we can study dissipation in quantum mechanics. And for this, I'm going to be uh, studying three approaches. So the first one is more kind of a historical one, but also I'm going to be talking about it later on. So it's I think that it's worth to just mention it so everyone can have a general idea about it. So uh, yeah, we know from classical mechanics that a damp harmonic oscillator is given by this equation. However, it turns out that uh, Bateman found that if you extend the degrees of freedom of your system, you can find a Lagrangian like it's the following. Um, from it, if you apply the Euler Lagrange equations, you can obtain uh, the same uh, equations of motion for damp harmonic oscillator, but you are also obtaining uh, something that looks like the mirror image or reverse behavior of the system. Uh, in this figure, we can observe actually what is this behavior being the left-hand side, the one of the usual damping for the harmonic oscillator and on the right-hand side, we're having its reverse image. Uh, when we apply the Lejeune transformation and this uh, Lagrangian, what we obtain is the Hamiltonian as the usual thing that we do in, in classical mechanics. However, the cool thing about this Hamiltonian is that uh, this is a Hamiltonian that it's time independent. Uh, it is constant through time. So this is something that we like about it. So uh, there are some things that, that are worth to be mentioned about this is that the symplectic structure is going to be given by the equation two as usual. However, we are going to find in here the first pathology of this way of proceeding. And that is that the canonical momenta that are given for that you can apply for this symplectic structure, uh, they are different from the physical kinetic momenta, even when we take this uh, factor, the dissipating factor to go to zero. However, um, if we continue the canonical quantization in the usual way, we're going to arrive at this uh, operator. And if we now try to obtain or solve the eigenvalue problem for this Hamiltonian operator, we arrive at the following. So the interesting thing about this is that we had classically a time independent Hamiltonian However, now in equation five, we see that this Hamiltonian is not a Hermitian Hamiltonian. It's a, because you are having complex values. So this is problematic if you want to have a unitary evolution. Now, what is the usual way in which we can study dissipation in quantum mechanics? Well, we can use the Lavangian equations, but also we can use the master equations such as the Lindblad equation. So just to uh, refresh your mind to some of you, uh, we know that in the Lindblad equation, we're going to be working with a total system. And in this case, the system for the quantum damp harmonic oscillator is going to be described as follows. We're having the system of interest being just a usual quantum harmonic oscillator. The reservoir is going to be modeled as a, a big number of harmonic oscillators, and we're going to be having the interaction between them. Uh, important to note is that we are in here on the H HSR uh, equation, we are already using the rotating wave approximation. And this is something that we are going to be have uh, using uh, in this approach. We have to be employing a lot of uh, assumptions and approximations so we can preserve the, uh, the evolution and we can guarantee that the dynamics is going to be always positive. So in this case, equation seven, uh, we can say it as follows. The first term is going to describe uh, the usual evolution of a closed system, in this case for the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. The second time is going to be describing the dissipation of energy. And the third term is going to be telling us the thermal contributions that are fed from the environment into the system of interest. So when we uh, analyze the evolution of a uh, of an operator or observable uh, in this approach, for example, it's it's interesting to study what happens with the energy. We observe the following. Uh, as time goes to infinity, we see that these terms uh, decays to zero. However, uh, we see that these two terms are going to guarantee some uh, well-known results. The first one is that there exists a ground state. And the other one is that some thermal contributions are going to make that the decay of energy is going to be above the ground state. So we can observe uh, this behavior in the following figure. Also, it's interesting that instead of being working with the creation and annihilation operators, we can work on the position and momentum. So we obtain the following equation that 
uh, we can observe in here uh, something that resembles the error of the CRM. And actually, when we take the classical limit, uh, we recover the classical equations for the time harmonic oscillator. But if we, instead of working with observables that are more uh, classical, if we more if we move to study the dispersions, we are going to arrive to equation twelve. Uh, I'm going to explain in more detail some parts of this equation. But the important part in here is, is the following: is that the previous system of equations, there is equations eleven and equation twelve, they are system of equations that are decoupled. That is that the classical dynamics is in some sense independent of the of the quantum dynamics. Now, what is the thing that uh, I am proposing in here? Well, I want to study the Bateman system, but using something that it's uh, on, that is called momentum's quantum mechanics. So, uh, in this formalism, we are going to be using the old idea of Heslot. That is, that quantum mechanics is provided with a Poisson structure in the sense that you're having something that a phase space. Uh, also, it is important to introduce in this approach something that are going to be pure quantum variables. And the cool thing about these pure quantum variables is that when you uh, do the Poisson bracket between the classical variables and these uh, new quantum variables, they are going to be symplectical orthogonal. Also, these new quantum variables, uh, they cannot take any value. They are subject to this generalized uncertainty relation from which we observe that the Heisenberg's uncertainty is hold. And Yes, we, we need to provide a way to obtain the dynamics of the system. And the cool thing about uh, obtaining the dynamic in the following way is that we can easily see the following. Uh, when we take the very first term, that is when we take A equals to zero and B equals to zero, is that we're going to have the classical Hamiltonian and all the other subsequent terms can be thought as the corrections that the classical dynamics has to undergo in order to uh, provide uh, the quantum dynamics. And this is an extension of this Hamiltonian formulation. So let us uh, first study and tackle an easy problem before just starting to study the quantum dump harmonic oscillator, uh, because this is going to provide some insight about how this method works. So the first thing is that we're going to be working with a generalized quadratic Hamiltonian given in the following way. And if we use the canonical quantization and employ the Hamiltonian expansion, as I showed before, we obtain the following a quantum a corrected Hamiltonian H cubed. And the cool thing now is that we can think of this a Hamiltonian to be split into parts, something that is going to be or resembles a, the classical Hamiltonian and something that is going to be pure quantum. Also, remembering that these variables are symplectically a, orthogonal, uh, when we use the Hamiltonian formulation, we can obtain again two systems of differential equations that are going to be decouple. Now, uh, one of the things that happens, as I mentioned before in the Bateman uh, model, is that we already have that pathology that the physical momenta is different from the uh, canonical momenta. So in this sense, I just want to provide a way to just try to study those, that kind of system. So let us think that this method allows us to strike the mean features of a Hamiltonian. And now let us also suppose that there is a way in which we can store only the superficial features of that Hamiltonian into a new one, right? So now I'm just defining new variables that are going to be S, something that resembles position, and PS, the canonical a variable for that position, and the quantum variables GS. Now, what do I mean by superficial? Well, at least I want to guarantee that the, is the condition of these two variables to be symplectically orthogonal is guaranteed, but now what I'm going to put in here is that these quantum variables are described by other variables, right? So we can observe that we re, uh, re, retrieve the same dynamics when we take uh, the Poisson bracket of S and PS equals to one and R and T also the commutator relations equals to H bar. So why this is important? Well, because now by having this, we can create an independence of the algebras of these two parts, right? There's an independence of the classical algebra and there is an independence of the quantum algebra. So this is useful because uh, we can see that we can maintain or keep the classical uh, algebra so we can recover the classical dynamics in the following way. But now we can explore different algebraic structure for the quantum variables, right? And here we can see uh, if we take the reverse order in here, we do not recover the same equations, but taking the usual one we do. 
it seems like a lot of extra steps, but now uh, you're going to see why this is important. So if we now go back and study the Bateman, Tikuchiski, Hamiltonian, that is just a transformation of the Bateman Hamiltonian that I showed before. Uh, right? This is our, these are the transformations. We obtain the following Hamiltonian. And I like this way of working because we can see a uh, direct comparison between this Hamiltonian and the total Hamiltonian using the Limblad approach. Right, the system of interests are both a uh, Hamiltonian upper, uh, Hamiltonian okay, for the harmonic oscillator. The reservoir is just a collection of harmonic oscillators, where just for the right hand side and the left hand side, we are just dealing with one, and then the interaction. So, this is what I want to test uh, because I feel really comfortable of using the canonical quantization because this canonical momenta depends on the opposite variables. I want to see what happens when I promote the physical momenta instead of promoting the canonical momenta. Now, uh, because the thing that I shown before, I can do it, right? So I'm just renaming them in the usual fashion, right? Making them to satisfy the commutation relations. Uh, sorry, but now when we do the inverse transformations, we can see that there is now a change in here. Uh, why also I want to test this? Well, it turns out that in another phenomenological model to study dissipation, uh, Dieter Search found out that the problems or the pathologies that exist in these quantizations are given because we are uh, promoting to operators the canonical momentum that differs from the physical kinetic momentum. So he's studying the Calderola canonic Hamiltonian and mine is studying the, the Bateman's one. So when we do that and apply the effective formalism that I've shown before, this is the quantum corrected Hamiltonian that we are having. And now this is the system of equations that we arrive at. And we can observe in here that these are uh, the conditions that we're having. So just as I mentioned before, I'm keeping the classical ones because I want to satisfy the correspondence principle. And I'm just taking or testing the other commutations relations as I showed before. So uh, because Working uh, and the abatement to uh, transformation is good, but it's not, I mean, when you're trying to provide a physical meaning to it, it's not that straight. So we can, again, use these transformations, but now at the quantum level, so we can study these dispersions. And the cool thing is that if we use these uh, transformations on the system of equations that I shown before, we can obtain the following. And this is where it starts to become very, very interesting because the classical part, resembles the one that we already obtained in the Limblad. So we compare them, we compare them and we can arrive at some conditions that if they are fulfilled, we can obtain the same dynamics for the classical part. So these uh, motivate us to study what happens when the quantum part. So we can rewrite the, the Limblad uh, dispersions equations in such a way that they looks a little bit more uh, like the quantum variables that we're using the moments. So if we apply that, we are going to obtain the following system of equations, but also uh, we identify the following. We're going to be identifying the fundamental constraints of the future coefficients, right? Uh, in some words by Decker, he showed that if you have those uh, the future coefficients in your system of equations, uh, you can guarantee that the evolution, it's not going to violate the Heisenberg's uncertainty. But also uh, we can find the same diffusion coefficients in the system of equations for the bateman tikuchinsky hamiltonian right? They are, they are identified in the following manner. And again, because the quantum variables are constrained by the generalized uncertainty, we can also arrive that they are obeying the same uh, constraint for the diffusion coefficients. So by, uh, by making this identification, we can show that the evolution that we're going to have now, it's not going to violate the Heisenberg's uncertainty. So let us study just uh, some initial conditions that just provide an arbitrary values to see what happens in the Limblad case and in the semi-classical case. So as we can observe the Limblad, there is going to be the orange uh, and the yellow one, they are going to be spreading out, but uh, the one given by the semi-classical model is going to keep uh, a certain width. It's not getting smaller and smaller, it's not getting shrinking. So it is a good indication at least. And this is the same for the momentum. When we now go to study what is the energy, we're going to obtain the following graph. And the most important part about it is that when we take the limit of having zero temperature in the Limblad approach, 
and when we see the same classical energy, we can see that we are having the same trajectory. I'm just putting it this way because these two trajectories overlaps, so it will not be possible to see one of them. Now, uh, you may be wondering, well, what is the difference between the result that you're obtaining and the result that you may obtain by using the, the quantization procedure uh, described by Feshbach and, and the Kuczynski or Kuczynski? Well, uh, in Decker's work, you can see the solution for, for, the, for the previous quantization, the canonical one. And would you compare all the evolutions of the dispersions, you, we obtain the following, right? So uh, this is going to be the most important figure. And it is the following. Uh, we are having here the minimum uncertainty at the evolution given by the Bitman model described by Feshberg and Tikhonchiski and the evolution that we obtain by using the effective method or semi-classical method. So we observe that semi-classical method keeps the minimum uncertainty saturated at all times. Uh, the limb blood are having these contribution from these thermal contributions. This is expected. Uh, it's going to increase, right? It's going to spread out. But the Bateman one uh, is just getting smaller and smaller than the minimum uncertainty from time bigger than zero. So we can observe here a very clear indication about the right dynamics our model is having. Even more, uh, there are some works, for example, the one given by Da Costa where they say that if you're working with the separate system where they use the rotating wave approximation and weak coupling at, at zero temperature, you're, uh, also if you have an initial coherence state, your system is going to pre preserve this coherence. So this is another indication of this preservedness of the coherence. Uh, now, uh, just to uh, end it up this, it turns out that some of these variables uh, remain constants throughout their evolution. So if we now replace them in the system of equations that I showed before, this is what we obtain for the semi-classical bedman tikhonchiski And now if we compare it with the solution given by the Lindblad approach, it is evident that we are having the same dynamics. Again, just taking the conditions for having the same classical dynamics. That is that omega uh, zero and just omega is equals to one. So just to end it up this presentation, uh, it turns out that in order to solve or provide a right dynamics for the Bateman a Hamiltonian, right, it's quantum version, you have to fulfill the following, right? The classical structure has to remain the same. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be system with another system. Uh, you're going to be dealing with another system. But the quantum one has to be making with the variables that depends on the correct variable. So in this case, X, uh, the momentum on Y, remember, that depends on, on the X variables, and the momentum on X depends on the X variables. So why this is important? Because uh, the Bateman system, uh, if you go to the works of Decker, uh, you, you can see a historical review, and lots of other phenomenological models are derived from the Bateman's idea. So in some sense, all these models are going to be having uh, these pathologies in some way or in another. So in here, I'm just summarizing what do you have to do in order to have a theory that can provide the right uh, dynamics for dissipation in quantum mechanics. So if you're working in a standard quantum mechanics without using the Limbat approach, you're having a difficulty in here because you have to satisfy two conditions that looks kind of contradictory. But uh, okay, I think that this is all for my presentation and this is all the references. So uh, if anybody has any question, please let me know. Thank you, Carlos. <clears throat> uh, so again, I invite you to, to use chat for, uh, for posting your questions. Okay. I think everybody's already tired after two hours. <laughs> so you are unlucky because you're the last one in this session. And okay, so I, I'll just I'll just uh, ask uh, like the uh, default question: what, what are the applications of this approach? How can you actually uh, use this 
I don't know. For example, for 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 uh, for, uh, for presenting some some advantage of quantum or not quantum systems. Yes. So uh, the main idea about this work is that uh, there is not. I mean, everybody has their ways to work with dissipation in quantum mechanics. There is not a general agreement about what is the correct way of, of dealing with these systems. So, for example, if you work with the laughing equation, what at the end what you're doing is just add some noise to all these uncertainty relations. They are not going to decay to zero. So, um, one of the the motivation is just try to see how you can work uh, with a general theory. Try try to go with the fundamentals. Now that we know what are the problems that exist, we can come up with a theory that try to encompass it. So the next thing that I want to do now is that, okay, it seems that this solution that I'm proposing here, uh, because the harmonic oscillator is just the simplest model in, in almost any case, uh, the next thing that I want to study is the dissipation into level systems. So if, uh, mm -hmm. if this way of proceeding can also solve that, then I could be proposing an alternative to the study of the separative system that do not involve the employment of the Lindblad approach. And this is good because uh, the formalism that I'm using comes from, from geometric formulations of quantum mechanics. So when it turns up to study more fundamental systems or systems that are I try to employ, I don't know, things between quantum gravity or dissipation in that, in that sense, it is nice to have something that relates you to dissipation or that opens a way to study open quantum systems. So if you use the lean blood approach in there, now you're getting into a problem because it does not come that it's straight to propose a, a Hamiltonian that starts from quantum mechanics to study these very classical systems. So because this is in between the two of them, it is more easy to try to propose uh, an alternative to study these systems. So basically, you want to have something which is um, easy to deal when you're going from classical to quantum uh, regime. Yes. yes? This is, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Any other questions? So well, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Ah, is there a software design tool to make the process easy? This is a tricky question. <clears throat> Hmm. I don't really know. I mean, uh, there are some ways in which you can uh, work with it with stochastic mechanics and you can have some softwares for it. But uh, in this way, uh, we're not having any comp any stochastic methods in here. So I just think that you just have to work with the solutions of the differential equations and you can use Mathematica or Python or any other methods. Okay, okay. Okay, another question. Oh, uh, as we all know, the quantum harmonic oscillator is the most studied system in quantum information. Can your effective, can your effective harmonic oscillator can be used to describe quantum computing since it's a dissipative-free system? That, that's very interesting. And, uh, and that is why the, the, mo the motivation of the next investigation is on, on two level systems, right? Because once we started two level systems, we can make some relations with qubits and just try to have a, a way to, to study them. But again, this is very fundamental and there is a lot of work done already on the study of dissipation and also with the development of the Lindblad approach in, in QuizKit, if I'm not wrong. So yeah, I will have to go more deep into it, but I don't think that it's going to be, I don't think that it's going to provide any advantage to the, the tools that already exist, but it, it may be interesting. I, I don't really know actually. Okay, we have some more questions. So Lindblad is the most general way to study open quantum system. Have you seen something about quantum channels or, or cross operators? Um, I don't understand. Uh, mm. uh, the, there, so there is a way to to work with the with the Lindblad equation, uh, but this comes from a more mathematically from more mathematical approach where you're having cross operators show 
uh, show it theorems and things like that, that all the things that they do is to guarantee that the mapping that you're going to be are going to be uh, always positive. But in this case, I am not working that way. And I'm just using the Limblad approach as a way to compare my results, right? That, that's the only thing that I'm doing with the Limblad approach for now. Okay, so for you, the Limblad is like the baseline which you want to compare yourself with, yes? Correct, okay. correct. Especially okay. because when you look in the literature for all these uh, phenomenological models like the Bateman, the Calderola Canai, and so on and so on, none of them, even if they are new papers, none of them make a, a straight uh, comparison between the Limblad approach. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of very, at least for me, it's something natural natural to do, right? That we have this very successful theory and you're proposing a way to quantizing the system. You want to do some kind of benchmark, right? You want to show mm -hmm. that you are at least are in agreement in some, in some parts, but also maybe your system has some advantage that the other doesn't. Okay, last question. Uh, for dissipation that scales non-linearly with velocity, can we construct Hamiltonian similar to Caldiora Canai? I'm not sure if I'm misinterpreting this. I, I am not studying uh, dissipation with nonlinear, but oh, uh, the, the problem that exists in, in the Caldiora Canai, and, and I think that this was already expressed by other authors, is that because you're working with a single degree Hamiltonian, you're having some problems in there. So yeah, you can construct and solve this Schrodinger equation, but you're always going to dissipate all the energy. So this is done in the Liblet approach and it's also done in the, in the Bitman Hamiltonian is that you at least have to extend the degrees of freedom. So I think that something similar is going to happen with the nonlinear velocity, but obviously uh, having that, that term is going to make things more complicated. So. I don't, I don't know. I also, I don't know if, if it's just worth to study in that way. If, okay, if you thank, have some thank work, you. you can send. <laughs> thank you very much.